greatest weapon of all. First step in solving any problem is recognizing there is one. It's time we started talking. Pain isn't something we thought. All we can ever do for our heroes is remember them. And they gave up two lives. The one they were living in and the one they would have lived. They gave up everything for our country, for us. They prayed for freedom and justice. Some veterans are not getting the timely care that they need. Less than 1% of Americans serving in uniform. Good news is, is that in recent years, we've made historic investments to boost the VA budget. What is it? Why should we care? We should care about press freedom because... Because we were informed. In democratic societies, free, diverse, and pluralist media enable public debates and are essential checks You don't look power. sad. Let's discuss. Hey guys, what's up? What's going on? Welcome to that, to that podcast. Uh, if it's your first time listening, then uh, thanks for coming. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, so today's topic is um, probably that concerns everybody at one point. Uh, involuntary uh, recall or the IRR. Yep, so the individual um, radio reserve, sometimes called the inactive radio reserve, is composed of former military personnel who still have time remaining on the um, enlistment agreements but have returned to civilian life. They are eligible to be called up in a state of emergency. The IRR is an active, uh, as most vets remember, in back of the days, uh, standby reserve as opposed to radio reserve. So it's a group of service members who still have time remaining on their signing agreements and are eligible to, call, to be called up during local state or national states of emergency. So the Military Officers Association of America, or how we're going to refer to it, MOAA, uh, that you might be a member of, uh, defined uh, a national state of emergency as American citizens being in a war for survival uh, of the nation. But um, that's what we're going to discuss a little bit today. So without further ado, let's go into into the topic. Yeah. So the most common military enlistment is four years active or reserve duty followed by an additional four years inactive. These inactive years are explained to enlistees as just that, inactive. Just keep your uniforms, military ID card, and notify the military of address changes. The members of the IRR are not under the Uniform Code of Military Justice, or the UCMJ, until they report for the Army's evaluation for activation. Marines may receive orders during periodic musters, sometimes without prior warning. Since IRR members are not subject to the UCMJ, the military has no formal jurisdiction to take action against the IRR individuals if they do not voluntarily report. And there are no corresponding civilian laws requiring IRR individuals to report. If an IRR member does, does report, even, uh, even if only to apply for a waiver from activation, they can again be punished under the UCMJ for being absent without leave and unauthorized ab- absence, missing movement, conduct, or unbecoming if they later decide to resist. There are resistors, individuals who, for whatever reason, do not report, should expect to receive threatening letters and phone calls from the military for at least one year past, the, past their report date. About a third of IRR members, recall, do not initially report. However, many, many will be intimidated into eventually doing so. The military usually tells IRR members that a warrant for their arrest will be issued if they do not report. While it's true that thousands of federal arrest warrants are issued annually for AWOL and UA active duty and reservists, this is simply not true for IRR uh, resistors. Thousands of IRR members have successfully refused the involuntary recall in the last few years. They have done so by not reporting for activation and passively ignoring the military. For example, they refuse to sign for certified letters and they do not take phone calls unless from a uh, recognized caller. Many uh, change their phone number or at least their outgoing phone message to not include their name or all for plausible deniability. 
If contacted by the military, family members of the IR individual often explain that person cannot be reached here. Please do not call again. Goodbye. <laughs> if the military can't contact an IRR individual, they file them away as a failure to contact. Usually at the end of the enlistment agreement, the resistor will receive an honorable discharge from the IRR, but it really doesn't matter. As long as you have it on your 214, that's the only thing that matters. Yeah. So what kind of what kind of types of discharge from IRR I can receive? Yeah, so there's the funny thing too. So if a military if the military believes that a no show is due to something other than failure to contact, the military is more likely to eventually discharge the individual under a general or other than honorable classification from the IRR. This is more likely to occur to individuals who make contact with the military via the phone or letters but do not report, including individuals who publicly refuse IRR calls or recalls. The type of discharge one receives from the IRR has absolutely no nothing and no impact on the individual's honorable discharge from active duty. One, one's GI Bill education benefits, VA medical benefits, and the DD-214 remain unaffected. A bad discharge from the IR may negatively impact an individual during an in-depth in background check. These are done for applicants applying for positions with the FBI, CIA, Homeland Security, but I've never really seen many people look into an IRR background. Seeing an exemption from activation, our mission was to receive, process, and retain IRR soldiers who reported for duty. It was a nightmare. Many IRR soldiers no longer had their uniform issue and had to buy a new issue at a cost of several hundred dollars. The IRR soldiers were restricted to training areas and billets. They were not too thrilled. Quote, quoted by a career military veteran, veteran and former IRR trainer. Upon call-up, individuals are usually screened for medical and personal status in order to qualify or disqualify them for activation. About 50% of those that report requested a deferment or exemption. Many receive activation delays and about 50% of those that request an exemption get it. IRR members most likely to receive exemptions include those with medical disabilities rated at 30% or higher from the VA administration or a claim pending for the same that is judged by the RRR mobilization authority is likely to succeed. For these cases, it is sometimes possible to receive an exemption without reporting. Applying for an exemption usually means reporting for the evaluation and that means real repercussions if the individual resists later. Whether or not to take the chance on an exemption is a huge decision that is an individual one that you gotta make at that point in time. So, in fact, way back in 2006, the MOAA issued a statement saying that the draft was not needed because the global war on terror was not a na national emergency or war for survival for the United States of America. So, um, yeah, so this draft was debated by leaders. Um, uh, from the American Enterprise Institute and the Selective Service Agency, uh, the ones that you signed in before age of 27. So, and uh, some retired and uh, active duty senior military officers, you know, what would be a state of emergency and what it is, uh, uh, war on terror. So, the current uh, projected image of so-called uh, state of emergency that even America's most senior military leaders admit does, does not exist, if the American people must be asked to share in the sacrifice via the draft, is the open-ended global war on terror that includes the occupation of both Iraq and Afghanistan. To put it short, so if nothing's going on inside the country, uh, nothing major, uh, so it's uh, sh that doesn't affect a lot of you know territory. It's not a state of emergency. One only need to compare what privates uh, were told to accept back in the day to what privates are enticed with today to see that there is more than inflation in play here. Our armed forces, in order to become an all volunteer force, had to no shit mix genuine patriotism with an increasingly handsome monetary care to get 
the adequate numbers of volunteers practically destroyed by the Bush number one and Clinton administration with the drawdown after the Gulf War and the exploitation of our ground forces under Commander-in-Chief in Bush number two. Thus the U.S. government is continuing under Obama and or Trump now to find it necessary to reactivate members of the stand, standby reserve or the IRR to stave off the shortage of personnel. Thousands of veterans and younger vets here that have been in combat harm and harm's way are now being faced with the decision to reactivate and forego the lives they have built since their discharge. Yeah, so um, those who challenge my stand uh, on this as a lifer and retired military officer to you as the, uh, somebody may say silence, uh, because only Congress has the ultimate right to take uh, the commission away, or if somebody decides to relinquish it, which uh, somebody might not have intention of doing because he took a moral or ethical oath as an officer that has turned into a mockery. That's one of the ways to put it sometimes. And uh, put it another way, somebody, uh, like we're not encouraging combat veterans to choose this path, but uh, upon informed decisions that obviously must be more informed than when you enlist or got your commission. Uh, so just understand what you are getting into from not only immediate viewpoint, uh, viewpoint but also in the long run. Uh, I don't think there is uh, any, uh, uh, you know, way to say that this right or this is bad. Uh, people who uh, get recalled and continue their service, there is a lot of respect, uh, uh, like at least from my part, for those people. And uh, because uh, in a lot of sense, our safety depends on them. And that's true. Uh, it's not a mockery, but somebody who doesn't want to get back, get married, has kids and has a stable job, job and doesn't want to get back into military there is truth to uh, his point of view as well yeah so i'm uh i don't myself i don't have any actually stand which one is better no it's definitely a personal choice for any individual choosing to join the military or choosing not to or choosing to go back in or choosing not to so like in this podcast we just want to give facts so as well as that you know the law and uh in a uh, case you need it so you can seek a legal counsel and have some kind of yeah. ways. And never listen to the legal advice from one in. So just because you're getting letters from the IRRs threatening you and things like that, it's just coming from one side. You yeah. might as well look at the other side before you make a decision whether or not what you choose. Yeah, the most important fact about this decision is that members of IR do not fall under the Uniform Code of Military Justice yeah. until they report to the evaluation for curation. After being discharged from the military, veterans are bound only by civilian laws, by the laws of the state. And there are, there exists no civilian mandate that states must monitor and track the whereabouts of IR members for the federal government. Uh, this means that the military has no formal judiciary measure to bring, for bringing criminal charges against an individual that ignores orders and fails to report once they are a veteran. Uh, of course, there might be a flip side if there is something like World War II going on. I'm pretty sure like everything's going to change. Yeah. But as for now, that's the uh, most accurate statement. Um, there is a good movie, a Star Plus, we're going to talk at the end, that has a line that is in, that in intended to get viewers who happen to be active duty members thinking about the consequences. And that line is, no judge in the nation is going to go up against the army on this. So reality is that the nation and that include judges are focused on the economy, not the global war on terror that they cannot relate to. So the base of the United States uh, is the actual economy that prevents the nation and everything else uh, follows. Maybe not <laughs> so, uh, so much, but uh, uh, you got to provide first before you and then you can think about everything else. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely misleading to say that the Pentagon has no recourse too well uh, to get you be clear on that. 
Of course, the military has certain forms of co coercion and harassment that utilizes the prompt and arm twist people into reactivation. Uh, these are what I consider a little overblown in the Stop Loss movie, but make this point relatively clear. However, these threats have no legal ground. You know, movies are movies, truth is truth at the end of the day. And no matter how good the movie is, it's a movie. So, for example, if the military sends a veteran a letter that says to report for a court-martial or separation hearing, the military cannot actually hold the court-martial or separation hearing unless that person reports for it. This means that a vet would have to volunteer to be court-martialed under the UCMJ. In the case of separation hearing, a vet would have to agree to voluntarily participate and in the, in the well-known case of the IR register, and the IBAW member, uh, Mathis uh, Shiro. If members of the IRR ignore all attempts by the military to contact them, though not signing, uh, through not signing certified letters or answering the phone calls, then the most probable situation is either a general separation from the IRR citing a failure to contact, or worst case scenario, another than honorable discharge from the IRR, which really doesn't mean anything. It's like saying you had a general discharge from third grade. Yeah, general under honorable conditions. It's a failure to contact. And yeah. the second one would be administrative discharge, something like that, but no uh, not, uh, yeah. negative. It really means nothing. Nice piece of paper to have, I guess. What matters uh, you get from VA and DOD, DOD both uh, uh, DD 214s uh, can be honorable discharge. Another another one can be a general under honorable, honorable, uh, but it doesn't affect the second one doesn't affect much uh, your daily life, or your civilian life, or applying for you know clearances. Yeah. So what is important to understand that. Uh, discharge from IRR in whatever capacity does not affect a vet's discharge from active duty. So that means that at this time, uh, no one has incurred any loss of VA benefits or standing from an original active duty discharge. You might be the first one, but mm -hmm. for now, nobody, nobody had uh, any repercussions. Things could always change. Pretty much the main thing, don't get scared of the IRR. And you can't count it either when you're trying to say you got injured during IRR time. <laughs> yeah. It goes the same way, you know? So if you get in an accident while you're in the IRR, it doesn't count towards your VA disability either. Uh, we'll give you some statistics we found on the internet. So this Army statistics covers the period in between September 11, 2001 and November 30th, 2009. Oh, 9,151, the number of individuals in the IRR as of November 30th, 2009. So I would have been out by that point. 29,970 IRR soldiers who received recall orders, slightly over half of all eligible. 14,854 IRR soldiers who actually reported for activation, slightly less than half of those who were ordered to do so. Approximately 13,000 IRR soldiers who requested a delay or an exemption, 10,500 were granted. If true, that is a 78% 78 success rate. However, we believe that the request delays are nearly automatic while request exemptions are closer to 50%. So 2,294 IRR soldiers who failed to report without seeking an exemption, 370 IRR soldiers who received other than honorable discharges from the IRR, 109 IRR soldiers who received general discharge, 7,312 uh, IRR soldiers were deployed to Iraq. That would be 10%. Whew. That would suck. 3,374 IRR soldiers got deployed to Afghanistan. So altogether, out of 60,000, that would make 14%. Uh, 14%. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And 731 of the numbered IRR soldiers who were activated but served stateside, of those recalled, 95% were deployed to Iraq or Afghanistan. 
And the sad part of this fun statistic is 28 of those IRR soldiers were killed in action or due to accidental causes while on active duty after they got out. And the most important thing? Zero IRR soldiers who were subjected to judicial action for failing to report for recall. So anybody who failed to report, nothing happened. And I just hope the 28 people that passed wanted to be there, you know. Yeah, I so it. that's it, guys, uh, for today's podcast. Uh, yeah. And then, so, do you have any uh, like movie information? Yeah. You'd like to share? So don't trip on the IRR. You just go work at wherever the hell you're doing now that you're out. And to mellow out from this uh, podcast a little bit, you should go watch Teen Titans Go to the Movies. It's not just for little kids. I don't even have kids and I watch it. So go check it out, it's pretty damn funny. What's the name once again? Uh, Teen Titans Go to the Movies. Teen Titans. They're on Cartoon Network as Teen Titans Go, but now they got their movie in the movies theater called Teen Titans Go to the Movies. Uh, we talked a little bit about the movie Stop Loss. It's a movie from 2008, uh, almost two hours movie. So it's about a guy's tour of duty in Iraq uh, when it was over. And um, he uh, returns home to Brazos, Texas. So he's ready to re-enter civilian life and unexpectedly army invokes a close and Brandon's military contract requiring him to return to active duty in Iraq. So, and uh, with the help of the close friend, uh, Michelle, uh, Brandon goes able and struggles to find a way out of the, out of his situation. So that, uh, that's a good movie, but as Joe said, probably uh, some things are a little bit uh, dramatized, uh, over-dramatized. Yeah, but not bad. Not still bad. a good movie. It's still a good movie. The timer's code of conduct. Uh, I don't know, somebody anonymous posted it. Yeah, so, Article 1. I am an American short-timer. I served in the forces into which I was so carelessly drafted, enlisted, recalled, stop-lost. I am prepared to leave them at the time so designated by the Department of the Army or sooner if all possible. Article 2. I will never extend or re-enlist of my own free will. If I am in command, I will never allow my fellow short-timers to fraternize with the lifers. Article 3. If I am called before the commanding officer, I will continue to resist his re-enlistment talks by all means available. I will make every effort to escape. Article 4. If I should become the victim of an involuntary extension, I will keep the faith which my fellow short-timers, if I am the shortest, I will assume command. If not, I will obey the shortest. Article 5. When questioned, should I become the object of a re-enlistment interview, I am bound to give only my name, rank, service number, date of birth, and date I am due to be discharged. Article 6. I will never forget that I am an American short-timer responsible for my actions and dedicated to the principles which have made carefree, happy civilians out of thousands of short-timers before me. So that's it, folks. Thank yeah. you for listening. Until next time, over and out. Thank you.